gosh, October. Can you believe it? This is actually my favorite time of year. This beautiful crisp evenings. I don't mind the rain. And the colors, the colors, the colors. I have one slide to show you. We're going to dwell on this slide. Um, okay, isn't that just utter beauty? Maybe the lights were off and we kind of get up close. You can see all that detail that you kind of you're drawn into the middle of that flower, that complexity kind of keeps on going. And all these leaves, they're all different and they're kind of unfurled. You think there's like a little microcosm in there. And uh, it's just captivating. You know, walk around your neighborhoods. I think there's so much stress in the world, in our country, and don't watch the news anymore, but just lap, lap it up. It's so beautiful. I think that's something to just you can see in any neighborhood. You can probably your own back here. So with that, I'm going to have uh, a little switch over in the slide deck. Kira Baum, Dr. Kira Baum, our fantastic naturopathic dog, mother extraordinaire, back from baby number two. <laughs> An all boy household, I must say. Yes, oh, right. very daring. <laughs> oh, thank God. Girl cat saves the day. Uh, and, um, you know, we're just so delighted to have this topic. I think five years ago I talked about sugar. It was kind of like a, a new presentation for the beginning of this program. But this is really going to be fun to learn about kind of what's our sweet tooth all about, you know, the science, the kind of you know, neuroscience behind it, kind of how to address it. Because even if you don't crave sweets, most people do, you know, they're around us, and I think they're kind of strategies you can learn to kind of navigate that. So I'm going to sit up and we'll come up right here. All right, well, so um, the reason for this lecture is that I've been kind of collecting these <coughs> aha moments about our sweet tooth. And I figured it would be fun to present them all together in a talk. Except that my talks are more of a conversation. So I am going to be asking you guys to infuse this information with your own life's experiences. And um, hopefully we can grapple with this information together and come up with some takeaways to apply to our life. So, here we go. We are not alone in our sweet tooth, in our sweet teeth. Um, there are certain global trends uh, that describe what people um, gravitate towards. And we can really watch this in countries where economies improve. So we can watch what happens to people's food choices as they acquire the means to do whatever they want. So this in the nutrition world is known as the nutrition transition. And it is predictable. We can really predict what's going to happen in any country whose economy improves. And I'm going to ask you what you think those trends are. So how do you think dietary consumption patterns shift as a country's economy improves? And I'm going to take notes on what you say. <laughs> what do you think people eat more of? What do you think they eat less of? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. Yes. So as you might expect, based on the title of our talk today, <laughs> people consume more sugar. But what else? That's not the only thing. More meat, more processed yeah. foods. More processed foods, more meat. Uh, so meat, processed foods, which you know have more sugar in them. What else? What else? What else? They eat out more. Eat out more absolutely yes. happens. Um, we're gonna yeah, let's do that. Eat out more, and when they eat out more, what are they getting more of? What are they getting less of? Carbs. Carbs. I, except well, with a caveat, most diets in the world are actually carb-based. Rural diets, city diets, 
but the carbs are different. So you mentioned one thing, which is that um, more refined carbs. If people were given all the carbs in the world, they would go for the refined carbs. They would also go for the carbs divorced of the fiber in foods. So more of this stuff's less fiber is what we see. Well, let's see it in a, in a pretty slide here. There we go. So here is a descriptor of rural diets around the world. Lower fat, lower sugar, higher fiber. One thing that you guys didn't mention, but I bet that's intuitive yeah. to you, monotonous. So if people are given the chance, they go for more diversity. Yeah, um, mainly carbs. And then here's us in the West, but not just us in the West. The US is not unique. And in fact, in some countries where, we, where, where the economy is in flux, like take India, for example, you have a large percentage of the population eating in this way, having more problems from undernutrition, and then you have a growing upper class that's eating in this way because they can. And, you know, they have a different set of things plaguing them. Okay, so when you're seeing global trends like this, you would expect that there are some neurochemical underpinnings there, right? What's motivating people to make these choices? Well, you'd be right, there are. Dopamine. Every time we eat, a food that's sweet, and not even sweet. I mean, there are some people that couldn't care about sweet food, but palatable food, and we'll define that a little later on. Anytime we eat a food that's palatable or sweet, we get a little kick of dopamine. What do you think that does to us? Makes us happy. Makes us happy, and that's what I thought too. No. But I learned some things about dopamine. Dopamine actually, so for a long time in the popular press, it's been described as our pleasure hormone. But it turns out it's more nuanced than that. I ran into this guy, John Salomon. He is a researcher that's I think at University of Connecticut right now, and he's devoted his entire life to studying just dopamine. He's done experiments like this one. You take a rat and you give it two corridors. Corridor on the left has a pile of food. Corridor on the right has a pile of food double the size with a little gate in front of it that the rat has to jump. What do you think the rat does? What would you do? You jump the gate, jump the gate? It depends. So he found The animals with a lowered level of dopamine almost always choose the easy, low-hanging uh, fruit. Animals with a higher level of circulating dopamine jump the fence. So you guys that would jump the fence, overachievers. <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, we see this kind of stuff repeatable in humans. Yeah. So it was based on the amount of food? That, was it the same food? Just same food, food just, volume. just the volume was bigger. And that was more exciting to a hungry rat. Of um, in humans, people that associate with words like go-getter, type A personality, have higher levels of circulating dopamine. As, a, as compared to people that associate, well, I don't know who would voluntarily describe themselves as a couch potato, but apparently there are people that would, and they have lower levels of dopamine. So dopamine is in their body or because they ate more? In their body, just in, yeah, good yeah. question. In their body. Naturally. Yeah. Naturally. Okay. Yeah. And so dopamine, that famous neurotransmitter, has more to do with motivation than with pleasure. Now why do you think 
one? Oh, oh, oh. Uh, no, that's not what I want. I wanted to go back to our caveman slide. Why do you think our caveman ancestors needed a neurotransmitter that would motivate them? Life was hard yeah. for 99.999% of our evolution. We lived in an environment of food scarcity. And food was not even, you know, apples, let's say. Apples were not those big, red, delicious apples we see in the store. They were little, itty bitty things. And so we needed something that would motivate us to leave our comfortable, warm caves and venture out in the elements for food acquisition. So dopamine, again, is for motivation. And any of you guys ever crave any comfort foods when you're in the middle of a busy work day or in the middle of that uh, project that is a little bit boring? You just need a little extra motivation on? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Of, of them with food, and so Lev has a lot more time that he's uh, been with food. Yuri just started solids, so, so, um, okay. So we know that we get uh, we get a little burst of dopamine uh, when we eat palatable foods, but it's not so simple. I mean, some foods are more addictive than others. Right? Mm -hmm. and, and so which foods do you think are more palatable? I mean, after all, we don't crave sugar by the spoonful. Most of us don't. We don't crave butter by the stickful. What do we crave? What makes foods palatable? Tangy. All right, we'll put this on here. Tangy, smelly, salty, sweet, salty, sweet. Well, this might be easier to answer if we look at a list of uh, the most addictive foods. And actually, um, there were some researchers at Yale. Oh, oh, gosh, I was, I, I was ahead of myself. We'll come back to this slide. Um, let's go here. There were some researchers at Yale that um, compri uh, compiled a list of addictive foods. So what they would do is they would ask people to make a series of choices between um, two foods, which of the two foods they felt the most trouble controlling themselves with. And they would give things like muffins versus salmon. I happen to find a picture of salmon on a muffin. Um, <laughs> to me. But, but, based, <laughs> but based on the, these questionnaires, they uh, made a list. And what foods do you think would be top on that list? What are top foods on your list? <laughs> Chocolate? Chocolate? Ice cream, chocolate, chocolate ice cream. peanut butter, <laughs> ice cream, 
Peanut butter, popcorn, butter, popcorn, cake, and cheese. Cake. Okay, I think we have a good list here. <laughs> um, and you guys are out of the money. Chocolate, number one. Ice cream. French fries, pizza, cookies, chips, cake. Hey, I think we're tapping into something here. <laughs> um, so, these foods have a few things in common. Remember when we first look at global trends in eating, and we said that people, if given the choice, go for diversity? People tend to like foods that give them a combination of flavors, and specifically a combination of three top flavors. Anybody know what? Sugar, Sweet, salt, salt, salt. Yeah, sugar, salt, and fat. I think there's a book by that name that's mm -hmm. really fascinating. Sugar, salt, and fat. And can you think of a food in nature that pairs all three together? The answer is not really. Really difficult to find foods that pair all three together, right? You've got fruits that have the, the sweet part, you've got you know meats that have the salty and maybe the fatty, but nothing that pairs all three. And so the brain motivates us to go for foods that provide all three flavors. Why? Why do we need all of those? Because it ensures that we get a wide diversity of foods and we get not only our macronutrient needs met, not only our calorie needs, but our micronutrient needs, our vitamins and our minerals. And so that was a little aha moment for me, that the foods we crave are not just sweet, but they have a combo. Um, so notably, sugar and fat rarely occur in the same food naturally. Um, but many of our palatable foods have been processed to have all of them combined. concentrated source of sugars, but oftentimes what we strip away are the things that um, slow down the entry of those nutrients into our system. So oftentimes the foods that we crave um, are lower in protein, are lower in fiber, and are lower in water. Because we want the hit, right? So these highly processed foods um, are more likely to trigger addictive-like behaviors uh, because they have unnaturally high levels of reward that we just didn't see in our environment for many, many, many years. When you say the hit, you mean energy? The dopamine. And, yeah, the, the neurochemical. Okay, so what can we take away from all that? That was already kind of a lot of information to throw at you. What can we take away from knowing about this nutrition transition and knowing that we live here? Are there ways that we can simulate this without feeling bored? Walk into any whole foods, there is tons of variety of pretty high fiber, low sugar things. Yeah, so unfortunately, we have to reinvent the wheel for ourselves. In a society of abundance, we have to surround ourselves with, with the health, 
I don't know, the healthier choices, I guess. And actually, what is helpful is to limit choice in general. Because if given choice, we tend to overdo things. It's called the buffet effect. Mm -hmm. If we are giving lots of flavors, we go for them. Because it's in our DNA, because that's what helped us survive. Because that's what ensured that we got all of our essential vitamins and minerals. So can you limit the flavors in your meal? Can you limit the number of choices you allow yourself to make eating out? Before, it was something that was superimposed on us, and now, unfortunately, we have to do it for ourselves, which is a lot harder. Um, the other takeaway was that the, the sugars that came up for people in rural places were coupled with the fiber and the water. And so that's what I would recommend for us, too, is as much as possible, keep the sugars coupled with water, fiber, and protein because that reduces their addictability. So if we looked at the flavors in a meal versus umami, is that the word? Mm -hmm. how, how do you balance that? Is that just like one dish? Mm. Right. Um, and I don't have all of the answers either. That's why we have to figure this out together. Um, I, for example, Japanese cuisine aims to give you all five flavors in one dish. That would be like A plus for a dish. But that would also be A plus for overeating. So yes, it might be that in a meal you can choose what flavor to push on the most, something like that. Okay, what about the dopamine stuff? What are the takeaways of that for you? Well, here was my takeaway. I said that I want to recognize if my craving for palatable food had to do with my need to focus. And in fact, I had a chance to practice that today. I was rehearsing this PowerPoint at home for you guys. And I was like, I, I really want those dried apricots that are sitting above the fridge. And luckily, I had these slides right in front of me. So I had to right there think about, OK, what am I, I have to do something instead. Clearly, what I'm looking for right now is a little motivator kick. You know, I'm a little bit nervous. I'm a little bit, um, you know, wanting to hustle to finish this PowerPoint to send to Susan. So um, I actually, I had dried tomatoes. And I had one of them. <laughs> actually, it was really good. It had the mommy flavor. <laughs> but anyways, you know, sometimes just recognizing what your drives are, that's the first step to coming up with something different. Would it be possible, what, recognizing that that's what's driving you and to go ahead and have the apricot knowing that, okay, I need, I need this shot yeah. of dopamine because I'm feeling tired, frustrated, or, you know, want to be motivated to finish that? I mean, I, there's no right answer. Well, <laughs> I mean, one thing though, you know, in what you said is that that motivation is not necessarily dose dependent. So if I okay. intentionally say to myself, I'm eating this apricot for my dopamine hit, then, <laughs> then I may not need to have 10 apricots. I may have that one and be good to go. Uh -huh. So dopamine mean, could be an emotional motivator or so that you want to go to the sugar rather than the dried tomato or the more sugary food to release that emotional frustration? Or yes. 
So as it developed, dopamine made us want to come back to that palatable food. And so it wasn't a motivator to finish the PowerPoint when it developed. It was a motivator for us to keep doing the behavior that would reinforce the burst of dopamine. So, so we do want to be careful, I guess, with what we do to get our dopamine because it'll reinforce itself. Mm -hmm. So if I rely too heavily on those apricots, I may be growing my sweet tooth with, a you know, with continued reinforcement. Because I'm not only able to stay motivated to finish my PowerPoint, I'm also motivated to use those apricots again as a little crunch. Mm -hmm. yeah. Huh? Well, I mean, I don't know. I guess I've always viewed it as being an addict, and if you eat the the apricot, aren't you just feeding that addiction? Mm. You know, it's it, it it's it gets fuzzy, right? Nutrition is a fuzzy field. Well, it's because you know, different. food we can't do without. So it's not. Although we can borrow from other addiction models to describe what happens in with food addiction. It's not, it's not the same thing. Because we, any food we Got eat will, will, will make us feel better, can make us feel good. Can yeah. I bring in another layer? The July mm -hmm. uh, presentation was on basically brain function and brain structure. And it seems to me if, if in fact the amygdala is, is vibrating about the emotions, if you have more front cortex, more planning, then you can kind of reason with yourself. If the dopamine isn't driving the whole story, no. it's part of the story where if you don't have those brain structures as developed, and she was talking about particularly the avocado and butter, those, those fats, that contribute to the development of the prefrontal cortex. It's just interesting to think, okay, it's always going to have this function, but depending on how well developed your, your prefrontal cortex is, which in the case of kids, it's not developed so well at all. So of course those kids want sugar. I'm thinking of my granddaughter. Of course those kids want sugar all the time because that part of their brain is still developing. Not that I don't want sugar all the time, but I'm trying to think about child development too. Well, maybe I'll use you more as a segue to that other okay. slide that I didn't know what to do with okay. about kids and sweets. That happens to be, you know, something that I think about a lot right now. Yeah. So I didn't know if I needed to throw it into our PowerPoint, but since you said it, maybe I will. Where was it? It was the one with Lev chewing on his toy. <laughs> the reason that I, uh, that I uh, wanted to put this in is that all of us are different in um, what we crave. And some of those differences are age-related. So children naturally crave a higher percentage of sweetness in their foods. And in fact, for them, sweet is an analgesic. It helps them with pain. And so, um, you're right though, you and I are making the same conclusion, which is that for children especially, it's a bad idea to keep them around a really high sugar environment because it will grow their sweet tooth that much faster. Okay, let's keep going. I did want to say Teresa's comment was interesting too because even though you know it's really we don't say there's an addiction to food, there are a lot of parallels to the addiction world, you know, other drugs that are used. And so there are very similar pathways that are activated. So it's it's a little confusing even for research to kind of make those analogies, you know, in a way that's definitive, but there's a lot of highly suggestive, you know, overlap. So it makes it even more intriguing. Yes. Well, I, I mean, I, it's 
it's not food that I'm addicted to. It's a particular type of food <laughs> that I'm addicted to. You probably don't crave sardines. Not at all. <laughs> or anchovies. I, and I like sardines, but yeah, I do not don't crave. crave. Yeah. You don't get your sardine fix. No. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I love sardines and all I drawer just dedicated to sardines. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm from Ukraine, so I think there's something else going on. Is okay, this, is that this is Lev still when he was much smaller and then forgot his bit. Um, so um, we touched upon this a little bit that you can grow your sweet tooth. So repeated, intermittent, uh, excessive intake of sugar leads to withdrawal symptoms, in rats at least. Teeth chattering, general agitation. <laughs> so uh, yeah, there is definitely a lot of overlap between food addiction and um, other drug addiction. In fact, I think this might be my next slide, is um, in, in humans, alcoholics and cocaine addicts actually prefer a higher, um, a higher sugar food, higher sugar foods. And that's kind of, again, talking about the, the, the dopamine pattern. Um, here's kind of something interesting. Uh, it's true that globally we crave all of these things that uh, you and I listed, but um, the types of foods that we crave are culturally motivated. So, um, Teresa, it was you that said chocolate was high on the list. Who else will uh, subscribe to creating chocolate? Yeah. So, um, chocolate cravings are endorsed by over 90% of women in the U.S., um, whereas a mere 6% of women in Egypt will crave chocolate. Interesting. Kind of interesting. And uh, oh, it got covered up. Menstrual cravings are reported by, I want to say, 60%. Um, let's just see. Let's move here. Oh, I need to get out of this mood. To move. Can I move this picture? I guess I can't uh, edit, enable editing, anything like that. I want to give you the right statistic here. 45%. That's no. close. Um, oh, thank you. Oh, thank you. So menstrual cravings are reported by 45% of women in the U.S. and 30% of women in Spain. So I don't know what the takeaway from that is, other than to say, you know, we, we're influenced by our environment. Here's something else that is kind of interesting that influences our food preferences that maybe you and I don't think about it. We, So you know your chocolate craving? Well, it might be motivated by your gut. So uh, microbial genes outnumber your genes in the gut by 100 to 1. And some researchers describe that as an organ, a microbial organ that performs important vital functions for you, such as um, uh, making certain vitamins for you. Vitamin K, for example, um, also influences your immune system and may influence your cravings. So individuals who um, said that they were chocolate craving had different microbial metabolites than those that said they did not crave chocolate, even when they were eating the same kinds of foods. You can change the stuff in your gut. Yeah. You can. All right. So takeaways. 
The more sweets you eat, the more compulsive the eating of sweets becomes, right? It's a self-enforcing kind of a thing. Um, and it's not just sweets, right? We, we made that point that it's palatable foods, the foods that combine the trifecta of flavors, the sweet, the salty, the fatty. Um, and so, what if you take a break? You know, there are some, um, some things out there that say take a 30 day break from really high sweet and highly palatable food. It might reset you. In, in lab rats, that process takes weeks. In humans, it takes months to reset. But, thank you. An interesting thing to consider. Here we reset by taking a camping trip in Hawaii and eating lots of avocados and bananas. <laughs> oh, and, um, um, this was um, I think this was Maui, and people just have fruit stands everywhere where they sell their own bananas and avocados. Okay, here's some other things to think about. So remember again that our body wants diversity and therefore it makes us more satiated when we have just one flavor, right? Like you probably experienced this. You bite into an apple, the first bite tastes phenomenally. Once you get down to the core, it's okay, right? Um, the first bite oftentimes tastes the best, and there's actually a name for that, a name for getting tired of one particular flavor. It's called sensory-specific satiety. Um, and uh, having an overwhelming flavor is even better. So again, if you think about our like really addictive kinds of foods, they don't have an overwhelming one flavor. They are a little bit bland, you know, mac and cheese or, uh, I can only think of mac and cheese, could I? <laughs> Bread and butter, popcorn. popcorn, right? So we don't have like a, a really big flavor. So you can use that to your advantage too. You can use sensory specific satiety to your advantage by having Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so like if you have chocolate, go for the darkest, most chocolatiest chocolate possible. Like milk chocolate is going to have a higher addictability to it than super dark chocolate. So go for the stuff that tastes a little bitter because you're going to hit that sensory satiety. Um, satiety. spices. Yeah, spices, use spices, cinnamon, ginger um, on your desserts. Pack as much flavor into your foods as possible, and, and that you'll find will increase satiety, decrease the ability. Let's see, it likes to make me skip through these slides. It works with the odors too. So we're going to do this little experiment, if you guys don't mind. I brought in some essential oils. And I don't know if this will work in this way. I mean, research says it works, but they haven't done it with essential oils. So here's what we're going to do. Before we pass around the essential oils, I'm going to describe, I'm going to tell you a story. You can close your eyes, you can sit back, take in the story. And then we're going to say the same story, but with the addition of these um, essential oils. So sit back and imagine that you've walked into your kitchen. And somebody has cleaned your kitchen for you, and it's fantastically clean. And all you see is on the counter, sitting beautifully on a plate, this really dense and delicious chocolate cake. And you can smell the chocolateiness already as you're walking closer and closer and it's getting stronger and stronger. 
and then you just can't help yourself um, and you take a bite. And for those of you that hate chocolate cakes and chocolate, um, then uh, substitute with your food of choice, <laughs> addictive food of choice. Okay, so uh, there's the story and I want you to think about how much you want that chocolate cake right now at, you know, um, 6.15. Um, think about that and open your eyes and um, I'm going to pass around some essential oils and um, just dab a little bit uh, on your wrist and um, if, if, if you see a, fla a, a, a flavor that you don't like, then uh, wait for another flavor to come around. I think I have eucalyptus, uh, mint, and cedar oil. <laughs> it's kind of intense. <laughs> oh no, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh no! <laughs> if you're allergic, please, please don't feel the. Um, don't feel pressured. It's got quite a. So yeah, get get a few drops, enough for it to feel really intense. Get some good aromatherapy going, and uh, I'm just gonna wait for it to make its way to the back there. Yeah. Remember when you had me eating like licorice at the movie dinner set of popcorn? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, cinnamon sticks. Yeah. Same exactly. Yeah. That would do it. Yeah. Does everybody have some sort of smell of some sort on their wrist? Is anybody still waiting? Over there. Okay. Going over for the nun that seen her way to yeah, I just bought that stuff to try to get the moths for eating my little moths. Oh, yeah. 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 Oh,
to also know with food odors. So with non-food odors, you get to experiment on yourselves. But with food odors, food odors are appetizing um, if you're subject to them for just a short period of time, one to three minutes. But if you're a restaurant worker and you're exposed to food odor for 10 to 20 minutes, it becomes pretty satiating. So that's another thing to maybe have as a takeaway for yourself. Is uh, It's kind of a hard experiment to run, but if you're exposed to food odors, know that if you don't eat that food right away, and you give yourself a little bit of time, 10 minutes of agony, you'll feel satiated afterwards. <laughs> kind of interesting, I thought I'd throw that in. Um, let's keep going. I thought I would run out of time, but actually, we're perfect. Um, whose mom told them to chew their food? I need some research to back that up. So, um, they, uh, in this particular experiment, what they did was they gave people some um, uh, pastels that had sucrose in them, that had sugar in them. And uh, they chewed those over a 10 minute period. They took another group and they gave them the same amount of sucrose, but just in a liquid that they downed in two minutes. What do you think happened? Who do you think felt more satiated? It kind of primed you to know the answer there, but yeah, compared to the control, which was water, the sucrose containing pastilles reduced, um, not only, yeah, not only were they satiating in the moment, but they actually reduced the number of calories that that person took in at the next meal. As opposed to getting the liquid uh, sugar, that actually increased how much energy they took in at the next meal. It made them a little bit hungrier. So, uh, so that's something to note too. Um, that's something to work with is you always want to get the foods that you have to chew the longest. Yeah, gel. They also had sucrose and jelly shots. What do you think that did? Where do you think that fell? In between. In between. Yeah. A little bit of chewing. Yeah. No. Well, that's one thing I've always felt. We're, we're kind of in this kind of a smoothie culture. Everyone puts a whole bunch of stuff, including really good stuff. It's kale, it's this and that, and they drink it down. And if you actually take those elements, don't put them in the blender, but actually eat them. There's such a different experience, fiber amount, regulation of energy, and a different. Of course, we just want it now, you know. And I think that that's. It's, it's unfortunate that it's kind of a grab-and-go kind of, you know, world. And yeah. we need to push back. And interestingly, it's not, e it's not even the fiber. They had experiments where they would infuse a particular solution into somebody's stomach versus having them drink it. And even that, there was a change in satiety levels. The person that had an, an oral relationship with that substance felt more satiated and so there's a lot of brain that goes into how full we feel yeah okay so takeaways flavor and odor intensity great because your body doesn't want that it wants you to have lots of different flavors and so it makes you tired of one uh, choo choo choo. <laughs> and those are all my takeaways, but um, what are your takeaways from this lecture? What really stuck with you? What's one thing that you might change when you go home? Race for vapor rub. <laughs> vapor rub! So the odors really stuck with you. Yeah, I wish that I could um, do some more hands on. Um, uh, learning because that's usually what sticks with people but hey if you can take the uh, the idea of the odors away today that would be great
Because it's really simple, right? Stick one of these in your purse and dab it on your wrist whenever you need it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I realized that a lot of times when I was wanting to eat, that I was really tired. Mm -hmm. But I had such severe sleep apnea for so long, and then I was better. I didn't really understand fatigue very well. Mm -hmm. So I realized I just wanted to rest. And when I eat, I allow myself to sit and rest for a few seconds. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I just need to rest. And then I got more motivated, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of the sugar, I just need to rest. It was really hard for me to pull that apart. Because mm -hmm. so, when you're saying don't put me as motivating, and it was really motivating for me to figure out what else I could do for mm -hmm. So I guess rest and just go into a hug. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, as long as you don't go for cocaine and amphetamines. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, this makes me think about how when I'm cooking something, like when I'm cooking soup or something, and someone comes to visit me just as it's almost ready and I'm ready to eat, and someone comes to visit and then we're sitting and talking for a while, so I'm having to wait. When they leave, I, I notice, at least I'm thinking about it now and noticing, that I actually am not so hungry and I don't eat so much. Mm -hmm. And I had never thought about being in that um, space of smelling mm -hmm. the food and sort of, in, I, well, I think of it as anticipation, but, you know, it's just getting the smell of it uh -huh. is, is um, satisfying, and it helps to satisfy the, some of the hunger. Uh, pay attention to that. That's a nice, I like that. Yeah. What yeah. you said about the restaurant employees was interesting to me, because you used to think, well, work in that bakery or uh, Dunkin' Donuts or something. Uh, right. And you'll have people say like, oh, don't judge that stuff. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like my mom, when she was young, she said she worked at a chili, where they made chili. You know, this guy was known for his great chili. People came in and all, you know, were eating and loving it. And they said, oh, she could eat as much as she wanted to because she worked there. But she said, I don't, I don't want to eat. Because <laughs> you're just smelling it all the time. So I guess after that 10 minutes, like you said, yeah. Or, or I could never understand how people would buy those cookie smelled candles, and I thought, well, oh, that would drive me crazy. Oh. So that made me think that I was going to get cookies out of the oven, and you know, and I'm not. <laughs> but maybe that would work just to have cookies out of the oven. So they would say, well, oh, God, that kind of makes me feel like not having cookies. I don't know. <laughs> Give it a try and report back. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes those candles, though, don't smell like the real thing. They smell yeah. like trying to imitate the real thing. Yeah, yeah, but it still smells sweet. <laughs> well, thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, and thank you for allowing me to share what I've been kind of thinking about with you. And um, hopefully some of it is useful. If you want these PowerPoints, let me know. I have. Um, the references for the studies that I've described down below in my notes. So let me know, and we can always talk about this in one on ones. Too. I want to thank Dr. Kira for a, a really stimulating lecture. I'm going to be doing this before I <laughs> hop in the car. It's not safe, so I'm safe. But uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting ideas that roll around. These kind of as the days go by, think about them and get back to us about that. So um, have a great evening and enjoy your smells. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.